um, I'm trying to make these scenarios sort of interesting. Um, so one of these ones here, a um, scenario is you've gone up into Mombolk, you've um, been walking through a nursery and you've seen this beautiful um, bonsai vine here. Uh, so this vine, you thought, well, it would look beautiful at your cellar door, you know, have these vines sitting out the front. So you thought, well, I'd like to bring that back, you know, I think it would look good at our cellar door. Um, does anyone have any idea, you know, would you be able to bring that back into your house or your cellar door in Red Hill if you're getting it out of the Mombok PRZ following our de declaration? So hands up anyone who thinks that you'd be able to bring it in somehow. Prohibited? Prohibited. <laughs> so yeah, so basically um, potted vines we consider to be a really high risk thing. Basically there's not much you can do with them, the roots are in the soil. If you tried to heat treat them or something, you're going to kill them. So basically, potted vines are out. Um, and so you just can't do it. So just something for you to consider there. Uh, Sorry, yep. do, do all these um, restrictions apply, apply just to Vivisipinifera? Yep. So that's basically the only host of phylloxera. Yep. So if you vine that you saw at Mombas was a different... Um, if it was a blueberry or something like that, you'd be fine. A raspberry... Uh, I think it's all, is it, I think it's all vitus, uh, I can't remember what the, yeah, it's all vitus species, yeah. I think it is all vitus, actually. I'd have to read our order, but I'm pretty sure it is all vitus, actually, yeah. It's all vitus, yeah. non-grafted. Yeah, yeah, I the, think so, yeah. If you don't know what the graft is underneath it, um, the, then you shouldn't be purchasing it or bringing it in anyway, but even... There are grafts that are tolerant, so if you're bringing it in, that's still um, prohibited yeah. without permit. I guess yeah. a, a key is that even um, the ones that we do say are either phylloxera resistant, tolerant, basically phylloxera can still live on them. Um, it'll be a case of either the, the feeding damage they do isn't enough to actually have effects on the vine, so you can still grow them. So basically it just means you can continue production, um, but the phylloxera don't build up a big enough population to affect the vine. So um, having buying phylloxera resistant, tolerant, whatever rootstock doesn't mean you're not, you don't have phylloxera. It just means that that particular variety will not actually show the signs as badly as one that um, is, effect, is um, affected by phylloxera. So I think um, never have in your mind that basically by having this rootstock, you won't get phylloxera. It's just a case of you'll still be able to grow vines and you'll still have production, but the phylloxera will be there just at the lower levels. It's still a risk, yeah. It's, it's still Vitis finifera, yeah. So, they, so can, they can exist on the root system or, in, or on the canopy. Yeah, and so that's why we're doing our amenity vine survey as well, to take into account basically these sorts of things. So if we see people that are, you know, they've gone out in the region and they've bought ornamental vines and those sorts of things, that's where we hopefully pick up those ones. So, you know, because a, a lot of the growers will say, well, I buy all my vines from a PEZ but then you might have bought from a local nursery just a, a nice vine for shade across your um, smoke over room or something like that. Probably should just briefly cover, I don't, we don't have a slide on um, rootlings that you purchase from industry. No. So if you're purchasing rootlings from industry, say someone like your lumber nursery, when we become a PEZ, they need to have the correct permits, uh, although South Australia is a PEZ, but the nurseries are very heavily constrained in their protocol from the nurseries. Um, I would always encourage you to ask the questions that you should from the nursery that you're purchasing from about their procedures. Uh, I, I would say any nursery that is operating commercially should um, be dipping their roots to uh, 50 degrees for three minutes, I think it is, or yeah. 70 degrees for two, uh, off the top of my head, but it's in the protocol. They know those protocols and should be following those. So your rootlings that you receive from nurseries should be um, followed by protocol and um, basically sterilised for phylloxera before they meet you. But again, it's about that fortress peninsula, fortress farm gate. You should be asking those questions when you're purchasing rootlings that those protocols have been followed, even if it's coming from a PEZ to a PEZ. No, there isn't. So, um, can I just ask you to repeat the question? Just yep. so the audio, your audio picks up the question. 
Oh, okay, yep, yep, sorry, yep. So the question is basically, is, does a nursery have any responsibility to ask someone before they sell, where are you taking the biomaterial? Um, so no, there isn't any requirement on the nursery, so the nurseries can just sell it to whoever comes to the door. Um, it's then that person's responsibility. The person who has possession of the material, it's their responsibility. So um, it, it works the same if you're looking to um, move material and you're in possession of it at the time, then you're responsible for it. So the even though it might be someone's, someone else's owner, if you've got possession of it, you're responsible for it. The nurseries are governed by their industry protocol, the nursery industry protocol as well, um, which they can, it can be enforced against them for not following their protocol. Generally, all so. your good nurseries do source from PEZs. So they do get it from basically the same sources as the, the growers. And that, that's the question you can ask too, is what is your mother stock? Where is it, where does the mother stock for this um, rootling that I'm receiving come from? Um, Well, um, part of our program, so with having the nursery industry being a similar thing to the viticulture industry, nursery industry understand that they're basically a risk creator for a lot of different industries because they sell so many different types of plants. Um, but we're working with the nursery and garden industry with the work that we're doing here. Um, so they're aware of um, the different nurseries and they're doing the communications with the nurseries in the region here around how they'll be receiving the vine material coming into the region. So... Um, I think you should have some confidence that the nurseries here, the ones that we've investigated so far are receiving, if they, if they are selling vine material, it's coming from flocks or exclusion zones. Um, so we're working with Bunnings as well, so they are aware of what's happening and they also receive from PEZ. So um, I think we're trying to cover that sort of risk through the nursery and garden industry. So mm. they're aware of it and they're aware of the program that we're doing here as well. We have learnt through working with Department of Ag that Bunnings do have a... Um a biosecurity officer within their company yep. who, who looks at those risk issues within industries for their nursery section. So uh, it's not the same for a, a lot of um, smaller nurseries, which is probably the greater risk, but those larger nurseries do actually um, understand there are risks um, through their doors. And so the nursery and garden industry mainly look after wholesalers, which is where all the nurseries are basically buying their vines from. So um, I think, yeah, we should have it pretty well covered, I'd say. So it's just unclear, we're, we're going to find a mini this spring, we've ordered grafted root leaves in the lumber, we need to get a permit to do that. Uh, to bring it into the PEZ, you don't need a permit for vines if they're coming from within Victoria. I don't think we've got any, yeah, yeah, then there's no requirements, yeah. If, yep. if, you're, if the vines are coming from a PEZ, it's a free trade. Yeah. Um, but the, again, you should always ask the questions yep. of the nursery that they fo follow the protocol that they should in uh, making those rootlings biosecure. I mean, if, you're coming, if your rootlings are coming from a nursery that is, is doing the right things, you will find those rootlings free of soil. And I think in, in most cases people agree that's, I would hope, the case that those rootlings are quite clean that you put in the ground. Even if they have remnants of soil on them, they've been through a heat treatment process before they get to you. They're the questions you should ask. So um, we've, we accept within Victoria that PEZs are free of phloxera. So there's the free movement between the PEZs. If you're looking to go in, into South Australia, they require certification to prove that you're from a PEZ most of the time. So even though you've, you'll have access to South Australia, there'll be conditions that you need to meet to even get into South Australia. So it'll give you that you can get in, but you'll need to jump through a few hoops on certification-wise. Uh, but within Victoria, you'll be able to just receive in, same as if you're receiving from South Australia or New South Wales PEZs into Victoria. You don't need to apply for a permit to come into a PEZ because we recognise there's PEZs as being equivalent to our PEZs. Um, but the permits are free. So if you are looking to apply for a permit, you can always just contact us and say, do I need a permit for this? If you do, we issue the permit. There's no charge related to that permit, except for if you need a plant health certificate, that's where we charge to come out and do the, that part of it. But the permit itself is a free thing, so you can always apply for it. If the contract doesn't come through or something, well, you've got the permit anyway. Yep. Do you have any 
you have a uh, historical knowledge of the mechanism of how the Yellow Valley or the Golden Valley areas became infected? Uh, so the, the question was about yeah, the historical, where the detections have come from. Yes. Um, so basically, for the Yarra Valley, I, it, we've traced back the, gen, the genome of the phylloxera, and it all goes, goes back to the northeast. So they're all G1. G1, I think um, Catherine will do a bit of a talk about this, but the G1 of, um, genotype of phylloxera um, is the one that spreads around quite a lot. It's easily moved, it survives, and it spreads quite easily. We don't know. Yeah, yeah we don't know. Because the, the issue you've got with phylloxera is it takes so long to express that it sits in the soil. And this is why we say good biosecurity practices are so, special, so important. Because it gets in the soil, but then it can take five years for you to actually know it's there. So you might see a bit of a lensing going on, and you're thinking that it could be just a, a disease or virus, bad soil, something like that. And then by the time you thought, well, hang on, that could be phylloxera, it's been there five years, and we don't know what the actual source was. You know, if you've got different contractors coming in, you've got agronomists, you've got um, fertiliser companies, gas people, you've got everyone coming onto your property, it's very hard to identify which one of those it is. Um, you know, there's some likelihood that you know, if you've got close ties with a vineyard that's in a PIZ, well, that's probably a good source of where it's probably come from. Um, but, yeah, we don't really know. Probably the other thing to consider in that is that the, the detection in the Yarra Valley was on a a particular vineyard, that doesn't mean that that was the first vineyard in the Yarra Valley to get phylloxera. It's just the first one that, in which phylloxera was found. So there's the context of the vineyard, but also the region. That, um, so yeah, it's, uh, I think there's a lot of maturity now within the Yarra Valley about the, the finger pointing that went on in the first instance, that that, that was an immature reaction to, to that detection, really, yeah. because um, there's a lot of ways it could have come in and it's not necessarily the first vineyard in which it was found that it was first brought into that region. And then if you put on top of that that you've got harvesters moving through the areas, you know, before they were declared a PIZ, they had harvesters moving from property to property to property without doing any heat treatments or cleans between the properties. So basically if you had it going on at a property and you didn't know about it, basically you're moving it on to the next property and the next property and the next property. So it's basically just spreading. So as Tyson said, it's very hard to say, well, which one of those was the first one, considering you're spreading it through the whole region anyway. So there is that sort of a bit of a risk, and that's where basically you know, having that fortress of not letting things come onto the property unless it's been properly treated is the way that you get the best confidence that you're not having anything coming onto your property. Understanding that there are financial limitations on what you can do, but just do the best you can. There's, I think there's, they're both equivalent in different ways. So you've got your contractors, which have got vehicles that could have been driving through vineyards. They've, so if, if you've got a contractor coming onto your property and they're driving into your vineyard and they're parking between the vines or something like that, well, then that's a pretty big risk to your vineyard. You don't know where that van's been. You know, the phylloxera do survive for quite a while without a host. Um, so there's quite a big risk of that van moving on. Um, as well as that, you've got their equipment, their clothes, you know, they're sitting in and out of a car. So that's a risk on that way, where with agricultural equipment, it's been in the vineyard, you know, that basically the machines are very hard to clean very well. And that's why we have the heat treatment as well as cleaning. So for both of them, they both have as much risk just in different ways. So I wouldn't sort of say that one's worse over that one. I think they both pose a risk just in a different way. Uh, so we might move on to the next fun scenario. Uh, so the next one is, uh, so your old man's finally decided to give up the Fergie. So he's done it up, it's a beautiful tractor, and he said, this is yours now, um, you can finally take it. The only problem is he's in Yarra Glen, he's in the PIZ. So you know, generally you'd say, I'm never going to receive a tractor from the Yarra Glen, I'm not interested, too much risk, I can't be bothered, but this is your dad's old tractor. So basically... Um, what would you need to do to get that into here? Any ideas? Heat treatment? Yep. Basically, that's correct. So 
You need to thoroughly clean it. Um, so basically what we want to do is make sure that it's clean. The reason for that is if you have big dirt clods on your tractor and the phylloxera is stuck in the middle of that dirt clod, then they're protected from the heat that you're adding to the, to the, um, to the machine. So basically you want to make sure that it's clean. So any phylloxera that is on, that still may be on the machine is sitting on the outside, so it's going to get heated. If you've got these big clods of material, heaps of canes, heaps of leaves, those sorts of things, it creates a little insulator for them. So basically we want to make sure that it's fully clean and then we go down to um, doing these sorts of things here. Um, just consider that steam applied at temperature above 100 degrees Celsius really isn't going to be too suitable for a tractor. The tractor's got too many bits in it. Really what we're looking at there is things like bins, things that you can easily get to all the surfaces on. Um, anything else that's more complicated, um, you'd really need to do either the hot water immersion, which I don't think you want to do with Dad's tractor, or um, put it in a hot room. So um, up in the PIZ, they've got um, both mobile hot rooms and um, some just in areas in the PIZ. Um, so you can send it there and then they can do the treatment for you. So um, that'd be the best practice on that. Um, I think there's the sorts of things that are there. There's accreditations that the businesses have in the PIZ. So they can actually issue you a certificate. So um, that sort of gives you the ability. I think, I don't know whether you can do agricultural equipment. I think you can only do bins under a certificate. But um, that's some of the options there. So you can move it. You can get Dad's tractor. The only thing is um, there's some hoops you've got to jump through before you can move it down here. And would the same rule apply for a PRZ? Coming from a PRZ? To into? Into a PEZ? Uh, that's, that's the requirements for coming from a PRZ into oh. a P. Oh, well, sorry, it's the same condition. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Yep, yeah. so, so that's, if you were going from Gippsland to Mornington Peninsula last year with that tractor, no permit required, RZ to RZ. The change now for us is that we're acting as a PEZ in the interim for the next two years until we are officially one. So a tractor from Gippsland would require the permit to come in as yep. of August this year when it's tabled as yep. legislation. And just um, also remember when you're sending stuff. tractors out to be serviced and those sorts of things. So if you've got a, a service uh, that you use in Mordialic or something like that, then you're not going to need to have a permit to bring that back in again. So that's something just to consider that, um, you know, even doing your servicing and those sorts of things, um, they're the sorts of things you're going to have to worry about as well. Yep. I oh, know you will, yeah. So because you're bringing it back into the PEZ, yeah. and that's, that's where the, the part is where you need the permit, is bringing things back into the PEZ. So um, basically it's free movement going out. So anything going out of a PR, PEZ is free movement basically within Victoria. So you can send it anywhere you want. Yeah. But bringing it back into a PEZ, that's when the restrictions hit, and, and that's well, when you need permits. Well, you yep. Permit you get permit? Uh, same thing, you would need the permit, yep. Yeah. So basically the permit will say that we're allowing you to either receive or send the material from there to here under these conditions. So you could have either way, someone just someone needs to apply for the permit, either way we'll just authorise that movement. I'd always say you should. Yep. Yep. Well, yep. I think you, it covers you then, you know that you've done it. So I think we, the way the legislation is written... They'll, they'll send a, if the permit says you need a plan health declaration, you'll need to have a plan health declaration sent. Sometimes our permits will say you just need to send a copy of the permit. So generally if it's a one movement, say your tractor, it might say you can move this tractor, just send a copy of the permit. So you just make a photocopy of the permit and send it with the tractor. Um, so we don't want to have you having to send useless paperwork for no reason. So if you've got one movement that's basically you're sending your tractor out to be treated, uh, to be um, serviced and then it's coming back in again, generally the condition will just say, just send a copy of this permit with it. And then that goes out, comes back in, and then if you're pulled up by an inspector and they say, well, why did you move this tractor? You can say, well, here's a permit that said I'm able to move the tractor. So um, the permit will clearly say what you need to do. So it'll say, send a copy of this permit with it or send a plan health declaration. And if it says send a plan health declaration, with the permit, you'll also get a copy of what the plan health declaration is that you need to issue. So I don't want to confuse you. Um, I think if you need to do it, basically give us a call or send us an email and we can run it through just to make sure that you're aware. Um, I think just the main thing we're trying to get through today is when you do need it and when you don't need it. Um, and so in that case, you do need it and you can get in contact. 
Yeah. Yeah, just, well, so generally you, yeah. Just to be clear on your example of the bins from the Yarra Valley, if you're a grower and the winery in the Yarra Valley is buying your fruit, the, imp the impost is on them to get that permit to bring the bins into your PEZ. So although you're a grower and you're farm gate security, you should be ensuring that that happens. It's for them to get that permit because they are their bins and they are filling, they're, they're purchasing fruit from you. Yep, yep. Well, it's because now you're a PEZ. Yep. Well, yeah, because you, that was moving within the PRZ, there wasn't the same requirement. So the PRZ is that sort of fuzzy area that sits between PEZ and PIZ. So PRZ movement doesn't have any conditions actually attached to PRZ itself. How PRZ works is there are conditions for you to move from a PR, PIZ out. So PIZ sits as a bubble. Anything moving out of that bubble needs to have a permit. Then a PEZ is a, sep is a different one. Anything moving into the PEZ needs a permit. Yeah. Then you've got this middle section, which doesn't have any legislation yeah. attached to it, which is a PRZ. Which is what we've been. And there's no, no requirements for that PRZ. So you've got free movement into PIZs, because PIZs don't have requirements for coming in, yeah. apart from PIZ to PIZ. Yeah, sure. um, but the PRZ itself can't send into PEZ, can easily send into PIZ but PIZ can't send into PRZ. So there's no legislation in that PRZ area. It's just a big grey bubble. And so that's sort of the weird part, I guess, where you sort of consider, well, where's the legislation? PEZs, PIZ are legislation. PRZ just sits in the middle, and you only need to worry if you're trying. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the difference now is just the permit. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which has to be both parties? The permit will cover both ends. So it'll, the permit will basically say, we authorise this business to send whatever it is to this other business. And then you can both get a copy of that permit. Yep. And then basically it's the same thing. Whether you're the, whether you're the sender or receiver, yeah. the permit itself is exactly the same document. So it's authorised that particular movement. So, so it's one permit. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then you just basically, you can both have a copy of it. And that's generally what we'll do is we'll send a copy to both ends. Yeah. And then you're both confident that you've got a permit for it. Um, but who wants to apply for it in the end? As I said, because it's both ends, if you're not confident that they've, issued, they've, they've got one, you chase it up. Yeah. 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 Put, it, put it this way. You won't get a permit into a PEZ from a PIZ until you have had a plant health certificate on that piece of equipment. So it needs to be inspected coming from a PIZ to come into a PEZ, but now it needs a permit coming into the what was an RZ. So if you, if we've been clear as mud, <laughs> yep. get in contact. Just confuse <laughs> you all completely. Which, yep. We should just say risk zone, infested zone, exclusion zone. Yep. Because so, RZ, RZ, drives you nuts. The, uh, there are certain conditions that you can move as a TIZ into a PRZ. Yep. Without a permit, that means that you can move the Yep. Yep, and that's the same for PEZs and as well. The same, so, yep. that won't change. No. so basically, there's no risk because basically, whatever processes, so they don't survive the fermentation when you've done the full fermentation process. Yep. The same thing, you know, when you put your clarified juice and you put it through the filters, well, they're not going to make it through the filters. Uh, the key thing is that it talks about making sure that it's below 20 microns or something, I think it is. Um, so, just making sure that it's below that. Um, I know that the industry does have an issue with microns because basically, you use the um, what's it called, the turbidity, I think it is. Um, so we're sort of looking at that at the moment, but at the moment it's based on microns, so you need to actually have a filter that does the microns. So it's the same protocol that changes the permit. Yep. yep. Uh, so the next thing, you've been up in Emerald and um, you found a really cheap sprayer up there. Um, so what, would you like, what do you need to do to bring it into the Mornington now that we're an interim PEZ? Basically exactly the same thing, heat treatment again. So as I said, clean it to make sure there's no big clods anywhere over it. And then I don't think you want to immerse it. It's a bit too technical for steam. So really it'll be a hot room will be the best thing to do for that. Um, and as, as we've got there, you'll get either a plant health certificate from one of our inspectors or a plant health declaration. Um, the next one, so you're looking to purchase some wine grapes from Warrigal. Um, 
so what do you need to do to bring these wine grapes? So you're going to be processing them here. Um, what are you going to need to do? Yep, so how do you do that? Yep, so yes, basically it's a, one of the annual surveys that you need to do just to prove that our property is free of phylloxera. Yep, yep. Uh, the other option is, um, which I'll go to here, is get them to um, contract process it in the PRZ. So you could move it under ICA 22. So if they crush it and turn it into juice, you can then move it into here under ICA 22. Um, the other option, um, if they're offering it and you're happy with it, is get it fermented there and then just bring in the, the ferment and then bottle it and do whatever you want to do with it here. So there's, there's a few different options that you can do. Um, I think generally everyone wants to do their own winemaking, so ICA 22, if it's easier for you, um, rather than getting them to do a survey of their vineyard, you could get them accredited under ICA 22, which allows them to move the juice. And just to be clear, exiting from this region at the moment, we're considered an, an RZ. So if you were to move fruit out of the region into another region, selling to perhaps uh, Gippsland with your fruit, um, that vineyard survey applies. Um, we have just had our vineyards surveyed. That is a certification that your vineyard is clean that could have been used directly during harvest. Um, but in this coming year, the same would apply. Yep. So, uh, as Tyson was saying, you can apply now to get access under PEZ for your fruit. So, you've had your vineyard survey. So, if you do want to sell your grapes to Geelong, you've had the vineyard survey done. So, basically, you just come to us and say, OK, I've had my vineyard survey done. Can I now get a permit to send in to Geelong or wherever you want to process it? And we can issue that. So, I guess from now, um, you know, you've got that ability to actually send into a PEZ that you haven't had previously. Just a bit of housekeeping for the one at time. We are running a bit behind time. I don't think we'll have a break. We'll try and push through, uh, if that's okay, because um, we are running out of time pretty swiftly. So, yep. uh, so the next one here, your brother-in-law's bought a contract harvesting business in Nagambi, and he'd like to come and um, test out the machinery on your property. Uh, what do you need to do? Too hard. So um, I think uh, generally on biosecurity terms, too hard sounds like a good answer. Uh, but generally, um, you know, as we've got here, same thing again, heat treatment. Just consider that they are very technical, very hard to clean, very hard to get them up to spec. Um, so when you consider the expense that would be involved in actually getting it properly cleaned and heat treated, it would probably be over and above what your brother-in-law would want to do to test it out on your property. Um, if for some reason it really, really had to move, we could go through this process. Just consider that it would probably be quite expensive. I know in the Yarra Valley, they basically, the businesses there have two sets of harvesters. They've got one they use outside and one they use inside because it's just so expensive to move it in and out of the PIZ. So, um, you know, they can spend well over a day just cleaning a harvester to get it up to spec to send it out. So, basically, the, the best thing to do is if they did do it, make sure the contractors are clean, you know, their shoes are clean, anything they've got related to them are clean and make sure the same as your contractors for doing your pruning and those sorts of things. Don't park their, vineyard, their vehicles in your vineyard. Um, so there's some of the key things. Uh, it's really, even though there is controls for it, really it's not ideal and avoid it if you can. Uh, tell your brother-in-law to go and try it out somewhere else. And the, if it was just a one-off coming in here, the cost would be passed on to you, I'm sure, by the con contractor too. Yeah. For that <laughs> day of downtime. Uh, um, and then this one here, uh, so basically this is one we talked about just before, so you're going to send grapes into the Barossa Valley, um, what do you need to do to send your grapes into there? So you need to apply to, for a permit from Persa, so they first want to have a permit, so they say okay well, if you want to bring your grapes in, remember you're in, you've had your property surveyed, so basically you need a permit from us. Uh, you need your accreditation under ICA 33, and then you issue a plant health certificate under ICA 33. So I don't know whether some businesses may have already operated under ICA 33 to move grapes. Um, they do allow grapes to move from a flux or a risk zone. Um, it's got some requirements around uh, making sure it's sitting, your um, bins on hard stands and those sorts of things. Um, but basically that allows you to trade to South Australia. So um, basically that's an option for you if you want to do it. 
Um, the good thing with ICA 33 is it's an accreditation that your business gets, so then you can send your bins as they're ready. So once you've got a full truck, bang, off it goes. You don't have to wait for an inspector to be here. So if you want to start harvest at 8pm and you finish at 3 in the morning, job's done, you can send it off with your own certification. You don't need to wait for an inspector to come around. So that's sort of some of the options there. Whether they want to buy it from you, that's um, your business decision, but um, that's one of the options there. So um, I think everyone's sort of clear on that one. I'd give it at least, I think it's at least 20 days, we say, under our accreditation. So just to get the accreditation, it can take up to 20 days. Um, we usually try and prioritise new applications over renewal, so we'll try and get them done as quick as possible. So the accreditation will take you about 20 days. The permits could take up to that too, so probably allow a month just to be safe. Um, so I definitely wouldn't be saying, OK, I can sign a contract and I'll send to you next week. I don't think you'll get it done. Um, the next thing here, um, you're sending your wine grapes to Mordialic, um, you're using your bins. Um, oh, sorry, they processing and the process supplies their bins to you. What do you need to do to get those bins? Yep, so basically the same thing again. We're going down heat treating again, get your permits. Um, so those ones there, you can dip them in water, you can also do your steam because they're not really very technical to clean. Um, so any one of those, basically, you could do. So um, just keep that in mind. Also, if they're your bins going out and coming back in again, same thing. So they're the things you need to worry about. I know um, in the PIZ, they've got pretty good heat treatment facilities at most of the wineries. So if you do um, either receive the bins or send your bins in and they come back out again, um, they've got heat treatment equipment and they issue declarations to say that that's being treated properly. We did have an agreement with SHEP, but I don't know whether it covers that. Because the problem is they've got different sterilisation. They don't do heat treatment. They do just like a general food safety sterilisation. It's not the same as an insecticide sterilisation. Uh, so I wouldn't think that would be accepted. I know we did have some requirements with WA for sending bins back and forward. And there's this whole process around cleaning the bins. And it's pretty convoluted. Uh, we don't have it in our legislation that we accept the SHEP bins. So no, so um, if it is, we'd be, we could look into it. Um, I guess we haven't really been approached by anyone to use the SHEP bins previously. Um, so if you do want to do it, just get in contact with us and then we can basically look at what processes they are doing. Because I know that they basically do it for food safety but not for actual pest um, control. Uh, so there's a bit of an issue there that we just need to make sure that they are doing processes that we would deem appropriate for killing phylloxera. Uh, and I'll try and be quick with the last one. Basically, this is the standard thing here. What do you do when you've got vineyard maintenance guys coming onto your property? Um, so they all look quite happy there. Um, I, probably, I think that was actually from the Arrow Valley. Um, so I'll just be quick there. So just the standard biosecurity messaging. So I think this has been drilled into you that often. Standard stuff. So I think um, basically they're, they're one of the things that I think everyone accepts as being a risk because they're so hard to control. Um, but really, as we discussed previously, they are one of those risks that still sits out there and you need to make sure you're maintaining your controls. And that's it from us. Any other questions at all? Yep. I've got one quick one about, we've got a tossable hedge around our property. Yep. And the trimmers that come up from Warrigal every couple of years do it. And their trackers are within about 10 feet of vines. Now, this guy goes from I guess um, you need to know, the legislation's written to say if it's been used with vine material and those sorts of things, so I guess it comes back to your biosecurity practices and what you want to do. Um, now, if he's been using that topping to go through and top vines, straight away that needs to be treated to come in here. But if he's just using a normal topping business and he's truning pine trees and you name it, everything else, well, just basically you need to get in contact with him and say, well, where have you used your machine previously? If he says, well, I just finished trimming some vines, well, then you'll need to make sure he does the heat treatments and things. Yeah, yeah. If he hasn't exactly been in a vineyard, he's been in the vicinity of a vineyard, yeah. I guess it, it's not legislated that you need to 
um, go through the permit situation, but it would probably be pertinent to get your hot steam out and, uh, and give him a real good wash before he came near, near you um, on the very outside risk that you know, he's been closer than he says he's been. Or, um, yep. <laughs> no worries. Uh, next question. Yep. Yep. So how do we manage the risks of contractors on the properties? So, yep. So um, I know that there are some that actually get them to change, have a change of clothes and they actually get changed when they come onto the property. Um, so it comes back to the fact of how do you go discussing basically with them on the practices you expect them to implement when they come onto the property, understanding that basically it'll only be the driver that can actually understand what you're saying. Um, so it's up to you then to work with them to say, okay, well, when you come onto my property, I expect you to do these things. So whether under your scenario you're saying, well, I want you to change your clothes or I want you to just give me the confidence that they have changed their clothes on the day before they came to my place. Um, you know, you've already got your foot baths operating. So I think there's, they're the discussions you need to have with the contractors to say, if I'm hiring... Well, exactly, yeah. 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 So you know, whether you um, have a process where you spray mortine on the top of the gloves to make sure that basically if the gloves are contaminated, there's no phylloxera on them. Um, or you supply your own gloves and say, okay, use them now and then leave them on my property when you're finished and next time you come, you use my gloves again. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we don't have some one answer that says this is what you need to do. Um, I think it's basically implement the best biosecurity practices that you can um, take into account what you can do. I guess there's layers within that too when we talked about Fortress Peninsula, Fortress Farm Gate, uh, asking them where they've been previously or in, in the last 24, 48 hours. If they've been in the Yarra Valley, then your alarm bells ring. I know it's a car full of people and they don't all understand you, but if there is a team leader and they're taking responsibility um, and there's an avenue of communication that's clear, it should be well understood that they, um, it, that they should be telling you where all of their staff have been most recently. And, and that's just another layer of of, um, of what you can do to help yourself that, to understand that they haven't been in the Yarra Valley in the last 24 hours, and if they have, really strict protocol should be put in place. Um, yep. What was that about yeah. 24 to 48 hours, sorry? Uh, yeah. yeah, so I think, um, so the question was basically, you know, the phylloxera survives longer than 24 to 48 hours, so how do you manage the risks, basically, that, you know, if there is any contamination, they can survive, the phylloxera can survive longer than that? Yeah, uh, you're right, and I think Catherine can elaborate on that further, that evidence is that phylloxera can survive for longer than that. I guess what, what uh, your best evidence from that contractor and how long and every person in that bus... Um, you know, uh, for instance, you know, with our company, we try and hold people on the peninsula for a month um, uh, and have the same crew with us for a month. And we've got the ability to do that because we're a large entity. Smaller vineyards, I think you, you've just got to do the best you can to understand um, your situation and do your best you can to implement your protocols. The contract vineyard staff are the most difficult one to absolutely tick every box on. Um, I don't, we can't say anything less than that, I think. And so um, there is options, you know, if you're worried about their clothing and those sorts of things, you can have overalls that basically they, when they come onto your property, they put your overalls on. When they leave, they, they put their own clothes back on again. You can launder those each day. Um, it adds a bit of cost onto the business, but I guess it just depends on where you want to put your biosecurity for your farm gate. <laughs>